Fast forwarding ahead to the year 1749, famous American scientist, printer, inventor, wine drinker, and beer lover, politician, combined a bunch of Leyden jars to produce a greater charge. These Leyden jars are essentially early capacitors, fairly simple, a jar with some metal on the inside, some metal on the outside, an electrolyte, and a conductor connecting the two. When he combined these Leyden jars together to produce a greater charge, he used the military term battery to describe a group. This is where the, the term battery comes from. Franklin is probably best known for quote, discovering electricity when he flew a kite in a thunderstorm that lit up a key that was hanging from a silk string. This is what, in America, we learned as children about the discovery of electricity. Eh, it's not quite true. He probably did fly a kite from a shelter that picked up a charge from the sky and may or may not have charged a Leyden jar. This experiment was a success in that he was trying to prove the concept of the lightning rod, a device that would draw lightning to the rod instead of blasting a building to pieces, which was a common problem back then. Yeah, a problem today in some ways. Today, most structures have Franklin's lightning rods installed and grounded to protect the buildings. Fast forward to 1780, while dissecting a frog attached to a brass hook with an iron scalpel, Luigi Galvani notices the legs of the frog twitch. He wrongly calls this animal electricity. His friend Alessandro Volta believes that it has something to do with the different types of metal that he's using. This leads to the development of what's known as a galvanic cell. The galvanic cell is an electrochemical cell in which an electric current is generated from spontaneous reactions. The most common apparatus generally consists of two different metals, each immersed in separate beakers containing their respective metal ions and solution, connected by a salt bridge or separated by a porous membrane. So Volta decides to take this a little bit further and starts to monkey around with galvanic cells. In 1800, after experimenting with different types of metals and liquids, Volta produces the first battery, which would later become known as the voltaic pile, a stack of alternating layers of zinc, blotting paper soaked in salt water, and silver to create a charge. This wet cell battery creates electricity because of the redox reaction between the silver and zinc metals allows electrons to flow, with each cell providing about 0.6 volts of electric potential. Now this was a big deal. It was exciting. Volta presented his results to the Emperor Napoleon, seen here, being amazed. These voltaic piles are fairly simple and you can make them yourself with some pennies, zinc washers, and some wet salty paper, like a coffee filter. You can find pennies anywhere these days because they're no longer used as currency in Canada. Your issue, if you want to try this, might be, where can you find zinc at home? The answer may surprise you, if you have sandpaper. Moving ahead a few more decades, Mary Shelley was unlikely to have conceived her novel Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, in 1817 without the work of the Italian scientist Galvani. Looking back at the creation of the book, she remembered conversations with Lord Byron and her husband, the poet Piercy Shelley, about Galvani's ideas. Now, these would have been well-traveled, vaguely wealthy guys back then who would have had the chance to talk to other well-educated, wealthy people in Europe. The idea that perhaps a corpse could be reanimated, she wrote, Galvanism has given tokens of such things. Galvani's breakthrough had come in September 1786 when he accidentally discovered the spinal cords of a frog carried an electric charge. Galvani believed he had found proof of what he called animal electricity, an innate force in the body's nerves comparing the frog's muscle fibers to a Leyden jar, an electrical component which stores high voltage charge between electrical conductors. It's possible that Mary was more strongly influenced by Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, who took up his uncle's work after he died in 1798. He defended his reputation and publicized the concept of galvanism. So it was Aldini, with great fanfare and showmanship, like David Copperfield or David Blaine or David the Magnificent, tried to use galvanism to resurrect a newly hanged man. This was part of the Murder Act of England, where you could only take apart bodies of people that had committed murder. So there were lots of people drowning in the new canals that were being built everywhere in England at the time. And Galvani tried to address this drowning issue by thinking maybe we can bring these drowning victims back to life. Galvani himself tried the process on an amputated arm and foot, but he seemed to be much more modest, saying, let there be a limit to conjectures. 
Like, let's not go crazy with this idea. He writes this at the close of the treatise announcing his discovery of the galvanic cell. His call was ignored and things got weird. So Adini took a man who was executed and left out in the cold for a few hours, brought him into the lab in front of a bunch of people, and started poking him with electric conductors. Didn't bring him back to life, but it, they did get him to flinch and wiggle. The, feast, the ghouls all came from their humble abodes to catch a jolt from my electrode. Attaching wires to other parts of bodies, he got a change in expressions and other really weird things. So this ultimately led to the idea behind Dr. Frankenstein bringing the monster back to life, who was a criminal in the novel, as you'll recall. Clearly, electricity and batteries had captured the public's attention and imagination. The race towards more useful batteries was on, but there was still trouble in Mordor. Volta's pile design was a mess, literally. A sloppy, salty, simmering stew of leaky ions, the brine leaking from the fabric, caused short-circuiting and thus making it a shocking failure. William Cruikshank comes along and solves this problem by taking the pile and just laying it on its side, creating a structure that's still used by some battery types today. Behold, we have the trough battery. This trough battery design overcame many of the problems of the voltaic pile. After the trough battery, the world entered the age of experiments from 1802 to 1858, when a wide variety of battery designs were developed and tested. Some even worked. Those working batteries saw commercial use in the railroad and telecommunication industries, but they were large, heavy, and couldn't be recharged. Those are all problems. Then, in 1859, the flooded lead-acid battery appears in France. Gaston Planté invents the first ever rechargeable battery using lead and lead dioxide plates soaking in sulfuric acid as an electrolyte. This basic design is still used today with two primary variants, either thin plates for starter batteries that can provide power surges or thick plates for deep cycling, a slow constant discharge type application. You probably have one of these in your car or boat, if you have a car or boat. Now you know you've finally made it in the world of invention and public acclaim when you're on a French postage stamp. Gaston made that early on. Moving onward and upward to 1881, the lead acid battery is improved upon. Camille Alphonse Feu improved Planté's design by giving the plates a grid structure with lead oxide paste pressed into it. This made the batteries more effective and cheaper to put together. Feu's changes are used in many lead acid batteries to this very day. You can go to Canadian Tire and buy one of these right now if you want, as long as it's not the middle of the night. A few years later, in 1886, the first dry cell battery rolls off the line. Carl Gastner invents a zinc carbon-based disposable battery, which uses an almost dry paste as an electrolyte. This was a big advance, a big deal. It made batteries safer and less likely to dissolve the thing that they were placed in, but that was still a problem. This new type did not require maintenance. You didn't have to add acid when acid evaporated, and it was tougher because the paste held the plates in place and could be used at any angle, so the battery could be moved around and it wouldn't become disabled by this moving around. It could be manufactured in sizes smaller than the original lead acid batteries, and this provided the opportunity for use in handheld devices such as radios. These zinc carbon batteries are still made today because they're very low cost, even today, but they don't perform very well compared to other chemistries that are readily obtainable. Then in 1896, EverReady, the company we know and either love or hate today, is founded. It started out as the National Carbon Company, later to become known as EverReady. It began production of Carl Gassner's dry disposable batteries, and by the by 1899, when the flashlight was invented, the company was guaranteed to be a success. We had a, a use that could not be matched in any other way. A couple years later, in 1899, Ernst Valdemar Jungner, a Swedish inventor and engineer, invented the nickel-iron electric storage battery the nickel cadmium battery, and the rechargeable alkaline silver cadmium battery. All three of these he invented at about the same time. He also invented a fire alarm that was based on different dilutions of metals, but that's for another lecture in another course, perhaps. 
Now, in 1903, Edison pops back up again, this time with a nickel-iron battery. Edison patented the rechargeable nickel-iron battery invented by Jungner four years previously. Edison hoped that it would become the battery of choice for cars. And remember, at this time, cars were predominantly electric. But his buddy, Henry Ford, decided to use gasoline engines instead, and Oldsmobile's plant had burned down making electric cars, so he had switched to making the REO speed wagons and other type of early gas-powered Oldsmobiles. So their decisions ended the use for Edison's nickel-iron battery. In 1946, we see the nickel-cadmium battery come into play. Again, this was invented in 1899 using nickel and cadmium as the primary metals. It was much lighter than lead-acid batteries, and unlike zinc-carbon batteries, it could be recharged. This made it instantly popular in a world where mobile devices such as portable radios were rapidly expanding in popularity. But there was a downside. The cadmium component was extremely toxic, and it could seep out into water supplies when batteries were disposed of in landfills, which is where most batteries end up even to this day. From the 1980s on, many countries have banned or restricted the sales and usage of nickel-cadmium batteries because of this toxicity. In 1955, the alkaline cell is developed. Lou Urey, working for the National Carbon Company, by then the owner of EverReady, invented the disposable alkaline cell. This alkaline cell went into production in 1958. It could last up to 10 times longer than zinc carbon batteries. So in spite of costing more, it replaced zinc carbon batteries in many applications. These alkaline batteries also offer twice the power to weight of nickel cadmium batteries, making it popular in the emerging flash photography market. So if you need lightweight, high power, you need to use a more exotic metal chemistry. And if you watch shows like American Pickers or Pawn Stars, you'll see them check old toys to see if the batteries were left inside. And one of the reasons they do this is because these older batteries often kind of chemically fell apart and they would generate a very corrosive series of chemicals that would eat through the toys, destroying them. A mass of oxides of weird metals. In 1972, the absorbent glass matte battery came into being. Enersys was the first company to commercially use absorbent glass matte technology. These batteries, known as AGMs, began mass production with the Enersys Cyclone. Lead acid batteries were prone to spillage because the electrolyte was liquid acid. These AGM batteries impregnated a glass mat placed between two plates instead, meaning the battery could tilt, you could turn it upside down, withstand rougher environments, and it wouldn't leak if you smashed it slightly. While popular, it didn't completely replace the flooded lead acid batteries because it cost more to make. In 1973, the Duracell brand is launched. Duracell had been eating into EverReady's zinc carbon battery market share since the 1930s under the brand name Mallory. Once they changed the name from Mallory to Duracell, these mercury-based batteries became popular with the military because they could handle greater temperature extremes than zinc carbon. In 1981, lead acid gel batteries come along. These lead acid gel batteries are popular in power sports applications. By replacing the liquid electrolyte of flooded lead acid batteries with a silicon gel, the lead acid batteries could withstand the shaking, banging, thumping, grinding associated with power sports. Now, nickel cadmium batteries became known as an environmental hazard, as we mentioned a few minutes ago. From the 1970s on, researchers had looked for a nickel base alternative. Stepping ahead to 1989, here comes the nickel metal hydride battery. Remember back to 1946. These nickel metal hydride batteries proved to be superior in almost every way. Shortly after they became available commercially, many countries introduced laws restricting or banning the toxic nickel cadmium chemistry, thereby ensuring the success of nickel metal hydride into the future. Now we move ahead another decade. Hey Sony, it's 1991. What do you have to say? Sony says lithium ion is the future. Sony produces the first lithium ion rechargeable battery, offering significantly better power weight ratios for slow discharge applications such as laptops and mobile devices, but at a significantly higher price. Production costs dropped quickly over the next decade as cell phones became a mass marketed product and weight of the battery became a key issue in many products. The early years, however, were marred by stability problems and lithium ion batteries that burst into flames, sometimes in people's pants pockets. What a surprise. 
This led to restrictions on their use and their transportation. These issues meant that they don't completely replace tougher, more stable alkaline cells, despite being technically superior in most respects. Of course, technology is evolving to this day, so they will get better. From 1996 to 2008, lithium-ion derivatives take over the small battery world. Lithium-ion technology comes in a wide range of sizes and shapes, from the size of a bus to the size of a credit card. Since their debut, officially as lithium-ion cobalt oxide batteries, several other types of lithium-ion batteries have been developed, excelling in different aspects of performance. That being said, there is no single lithium-ion battery that is universally better than all the others. The first battery that can bend was originally popular for applications where space meant literally a flexible battery would help. Later bendable products were also made possible by this breakthrough, including bendable smartphones. Panasonic and Tesla have really stepped up the game with their 4680 battery. 4680 in the name represents the size of the battery, 46 millimeters by 80 millimeters. Panasonic's 4680 cylindrical battery was previewed at Tesla's battery day last year. The battery stores about five times as much energy and costs half as much to build as the 2170 lithium ion cells Tesla currently uses in its Model 3 and Model Y, which are also provided by Panasonic. Now, when we go to grid storage, grid storage allows for the storage of solar, wind, and even traditional energy for dealing with peak loads when everyone's using the air conditioner, everyone's making popcorn, everyone's doing something. Tiger King is on. This eliminates the need for expensive gas peaker plants that kick on when the grid is stressed by this overloading. Also, they allow for use at night when Solar photovoltaic is not effective. Solutions like the Tesla Megapack are available today, but they're pretty expensive at about $300 per kilowatt hour. Other technologies include iron air batteries that can store large amounts of energy for over 100 hours. They're basically giant rust batteries made of iron, salt water, and air. They have quick charge discharge times and they don't degrade even after 20 years of use. Known as iron flow or open flow technology, this is also called a long duration energy storage battery. The batteries are safer, non-toxic, made of cheap, abundant materials, and they are non-flammable. Iron, water, and salt are almost free. They're very easy to obtain. They're very abundant. These batteries, however, are large, with each 500 kilowatt device being roughly the size of a storage container, semi-truck trailer. This is enough to power 20 to 30 homes. The cost is about the same as the Tesla Megapack at 300 kilowatts per hour, but it's expected to drop to 200 kilowatts per hour by 2025. They do have some ongoing problems with hydrogen generation that are now coming under control, but another company called Form Energy is currently advancing faster, producing systems at a lower cost. So how do these things work? Well, they work by using the rust cycle. This rust cycle of iron stores and releases energy. Iron pellets exposed to the air oxidize, which we call rust. This generates electrons, which can be used to power things. To reverse the process, salt water is pumped into the cell and electrons go back into the iron oxide converting it back to native iron. Rusting releases electrons to power devices. Reversing the process by charging uses electrons to return the unoxidized state of iron. If costs can be brought down to about $20 a kilowatt hour, it would save billions of dollars in energy costs each year, which is a lot. The first facility is expected to go operational in 2023, and there are great hopes for this to work. Not as a replacement for lithium ion mega packs and other similar devices, but as a complement to them. They'll never be small enough to fit in a vehicle or a phone. And just imagine salt water in your computer. Maybe some of you have already experienced that. Zinc and aluminum batteries work in a similar way with aluminum batteries being energy dense enough to use in cars for a thousand mile trip. The downside is they're not rechargeable. So you'd have to replace the battery when it runs down, which is proposed to happen at aluminum battery facilities along the nation's highway. So uh, it's gonna be rough to get this to work. Lithium sulfur and lithium carbon batteries are coming soon. They promise greater energy density, which should make them very useful in phones, ear pods, air pods, iPods, any pods. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time here and you guys want to graduate or at least finish this course. So I'll mention one more thing. Growing up, I've been listening to hydrogen clean energy propaganda my entire life. And the more I learn, the less I think vaping is ever going to work. Yes, vaping is the EV term for hydrogen powered vehicles. 
Hydrogen burns clean, producing water vapor as a waste product, but it is very flammable. And as a result, this lack of storage, safe storage, and other problems made me give up. But just like in the Godfather movie, they keep bringing me back in. Now, this is going to be the maybe the weirdest thing we've talked about in the battery world. Imagine a cassette tape or an 8-track tape. You might have to Google that that absorbs hydrogen and safely stores it on the tape. To get the hydrogen back, you play the tape back under a laser. The laser reverses the polarity of the tape, releasing hydrogen fuel. When the tape is over, pop another one in. The tapes can also be recharged in about five minutes. Basically how this works is the tape, which is one-tenth the thickness of the width of a human hair, is negatively polarized. It wants to absorb positively charged hydrogen ions. The hydronium ions are going to stick to this tape. This tape is non-flammable. It's safe. The hydrogen doesn't fall off. What the tape does have in it is some magnesium. And magnesium in this case is used just like it is in chlorophyll to react with light. In this case, when the tape reacts with light, the laser, the polarity of the tape is reversed and the hydrogen is set free. And once it's set free, it can be introduced into a fuel cell and generate electricity. This is so different, so cool, so effective, that when it was announced, the US Department of Energy declared the technology to be transformative and banned its use until 2017, which delayed progress. They were worried that someone was gonna use this to fuel missiles, but that's not happening. So the net result is we now have a basically a cassette tape that we can pop into a vehicle, we can drive until that tape is done playing, pop another cassette in, keep driving, or exchange the tape, or recharge the tape at a recharging center. So all of these are brand new technologies. There's a lot of hope for the future. We're really just at the beginning of the possibilities of cheap energy storage right now. So the reason we went through this long 200-year process of the history of batteries is to give you some idea how quickly things change. And once things change, they don't stay in that new state. They progress, they change again. So we're right at the cusp of a new era of energy, which is kind of cool and pretty exciting. So with that, I will stop talking about batteries.